Welcome to episode 36 of The Putting Couch, brought to you by the Seymour Putter Company's tour team. I'm Jim Grunberg, along with Ted Galena and Cody Hale. And today, uh, we have a guest that we've really wanted to have on for quite some time, but we just haven't been able to reel him in. But we've got Joe Hallett today, who is uh, is the director of instruction over at the uh, Vanderbilt Legends Golf Club. He's also formerly been a uh, top instructor with the PGA of America. He has been featured in television advertising, I think, some somewhere in a bathtub with some wine or something like that i mean something crazy and uh joe uh we are really pleased to have you on you also spend a lot of time on the lpga tour you work with top college players and you work with a lot of juniors and uh so we really want to talk to you about uh you know, teaching putting and everything you've learned out there about you know not just uh, the putting stroke but equipment uh, reading greens and, and how that applies across uh, all levels of your students. So, Joe, great to have you on. Well, thank you very much, Jim. And, and after that introduction and mentioning the uh, advertising scene in the bathtub, I may resort either my Fifth Amendment or shorten all my answers to yes and no at this point. So. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm sure we can find it on Google, but nobody's going to check. You know, it, it, it seems like the kind of thing when you're young, you know, and the PGA says, oh, would you, you know, and you, sure, whatever you need. And then when the thing came out, it says you will be in a bathing suit in a bathtub. I was like, uh, now I need to read before I say yes. <laughs> so, we, uh, yeah. All right. Other than just hanging you out to dry right there, we won't do that again. No, that's that's perfect. And uh, of course, Jim, seeing you and Cody out on the LPGA tour with Seymour. Uh, has kind of been one of those nice, hopefully on your side as well as mine, it's been one of those nice breaks during the day where you kind of get to catch up with old friends that literally you're a quarter mile away from, but you have to go to Indianapolis or San, San Diego to really hang out with somebody. I haven't understood yeah. that. Isn't that funny? How nice that to see you here on <laughs> campus for once. So uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, so I know you're also, you, you've done a lot of work with, uh, with Aimpoint. We haven't really talked much about um, aim point and, and, you know, the highest levels of green reading so far on the putting couch. So I know we want to talk about everything and learn everything about you and, you know, how you're doing, what you're doing. But, um, I know at some point love to hear about that too. So, um, you know, I don't know if you want to jump right into that, but I, I, I know on tour, we see a lot of the a lot of using, uh, using aim point and, um, you know, it's, uh, tell us a little bit about how that works. Well, you know, honestly, I've been, um, kind of lucky enough to get to know Mark Sweeney, who's the developer of Aimpoint over the past, gosh, eight to nine years. And my first kind of, um, I guess you would say experience with it was walking around in a practice round with uh, both Stacy and her caddy, Travis. And it's, I can tell you exactly where it was. We were in Pellville, Alabama, and just literally they would do the weirdest things on the greens because normally you walk around in a practice round and they hit a tee shot, they hit an approach shot, and then you spend about 28 minutes on the green hitting from every possible direction known to man. And I watched Stacy and Travis and they would start saying these really weird things. It's like they were speaking their own language and they would say, well, there's a saddle here. There's a crown here. And the influx is right there. And they would go and they would hit four putts and they would go, okay, we've, we've done enough. We're going to leave. And literally that entire process, finally about the ninth hole, I said, okay, you're, you're on to something here. What is it that you're doing? And she said, there's only four types of green structures that can really work to essentially make a green playable and manufacturable and maintainable, if that makes sense. Sure, you could build a wacky green, but they kind of either got to be leaning one way or leaning another. They come down into a valley or they have a hill. And then they started explaining what those words meant. And to watch what she would do, she knew more about the green in four putts than the other players knew in 10 minutes of hitting 30 putts. And that's kind of where the whole thing started. And I asked Travis about it and Travis said, it was three days of the worst headache I've ever had in my entire life, (laughs) but he gets it. And essentially for, I mean, it, it kind of the, for me, especially the dumbed down version of it is this, there's a couple of ways to really look at it. And, um, one of the things to, to kind of think about is there's something that, Every green that has stood the test of time has to do, and it has to drain water. Mm -hmm. You could build a green like a shallow teacup. It would be the most favorite hole on the golf course. (laughs) But in 21 days, 
the grain is start to it's going to have algae it's going to start to decay so not only is there a designer purpose there is also a maintenance purpose and mark sweeney always gives one of the coolest examples and we've all been out there on the golf course when we've seen these torrential rainstorms and you're in the clubhouse and you're going, wow, look at the green over on number 12. There's a huge river kind of zigzagging in the middle of it. And Mark always says, well, you should take a picture of that because Mother Nature just told you where the only straight putts in that hole are. Hmm. And literally, that's it. And when you start seeing that, there's kind of a mantra that in, in Aimpoint, what you're really looking to do is take into account the worst thing between you and the hole and play for it. And it's it's a matter of people see, OK, you got to hold up fingers and you have to people see people walking along the green. Well, believe it or not, you can feel things with your feet. And just for fun, sometimes if you're on your practice green, go over towards where you see a little bit of a big hill. Usually they're towards the side of the green and kind of start in a flat spot and walk up it sideways. And you're going to notice some difference in your feet. And realistically you can apply numbers to those and those numbers in itself are literally probably people that are really good at this it's probably within half a degree of what the percent grade of the green is and once you know that now you're off to the races and and this this thing with it, it seems so interesting with holding the fingers in front of your face and i i shared this with uh, some gentlemen here in the legends club that i had taught the original system to which had a book and charts and numbers and i can never forget this craig said to me i, I said hold three fingers in front of your face and he goes oh this is an old military trick it's been around for years and i said mm -hmm. what and he said yeah your interference is the ground mine was the wind when i was in vietnam we took into account for it using the same exact thing you're doing he said we really? didn't these things off with computers <laughs> And he goes, and we had to hit our target back then. That was that important. But we knew based on the direction the wind was going, whether to hold up one finger, two or three. Mm -hmm. And yours is the hill. If it's a little, it's one. If it's two. So there's there's a lot more to that. But it's funny when you first point this out to people and you show them that they're like, oh, my gosh. And notoriously, Mark Sweeney will say the, the probably the 99 percent reaction is. Well, there's no way it's going to break that much. And of course, it does break that much. And much, much to my chagrin, I can always remember I taught two really cool gentlemen in Rapid City, South Dakota. And they literally, they were so excited about this. And they said, we got to take them out to number 14. Well, it was kind of like an eight degree slope, which is almost impossible. And uh, literally Jeff and Tim, and Tim's back there and he's reading the putt and he goes, there's, there, there's there's just no way this ball is going to break that much. And it's about a 40 footer. And of course it does. It ends up breaking about 25 feet and he makes it. And he, with a straight face, he looks back at me and goes, yeah, but that's still too much break. <laughs> and Jeff said, like, you see the idiot I have to play golf with twice a week. Right. So it's, it's really a system that has, has developed and shown players another avenue besides your eyes. Um, you'll hear these great comments all the time and it's, it's it gets past us because golf has so much lore and so much. You always want that information from the veterans and you'd go out to the Broadmoor and they'd say, now be, be aware on 14, that ball is going to break dead uphill. I promise you. And Mark Sweeney will scratch his head and go, there's no ball that randomly when put on a hill is going to roll <laughs> upwards. <laughs> and you know, you go out to the ANA out in Palm Springs and everybody says, okay, no matter what, it breaks towards Indio. And I was just like, okay, what is Indio? And they go, it's a town about 45 miles away from here. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's not going to affect the 23 feet with yeah. you and your ball. And it's 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 amazingly simple. And uh, I mean, it, it's something that I would tell you if you haven't yeah. investigated it. Yeah. I mean, literally, you take in you you take aim point and you put a Seymour putter in your hand, so you know you're square. The only thing you got to do now is figure out how far to take that sucker back and hit it yep. the right distance. I mean, you're taking all the variables <laughs> out and it's it's the people that are good at it. It's a skill. And uh, Cody, I'm just remember because we chatted a little bit ahead of time on this. There's two reasons that M Mark really that that's kind of his underlying purpose of this. And one is it's kind of a cool story, but he watched the British Open one year. And he literally sat there, as he said, with a Guinness in his hand to be an, you know, an absolute authentic right. watcher of the British Open. <laughs> but he saw, as can happen over there, I believe he said 28 players 
their shots ended up in the exact same spot. Every player missed the putt the exact same way. They didn't miss it randomly. It was the same miss. Yeah. And yeah. at Mark's level of intelligence, he said, that's, that's an anomaly. That's just not random missing. How is it? And then he said, how is it that 56 uh, sets of the best eyes, the caddy and the player could all make the same mistake? It can't possibly happen. And he went on this quest and his quest really was to a make more putts that'll speed the game up and B develop a process that needs to be done very quickly. That can give you the answer without walking all around the green. You check out what's between you and the hole. You get that process done. And I mean, I've, I've played enough golf with him to kind of go, as a matter of fact, we were just at Pinehurst and the caddy was kind of funny because he would, he said, this guy really reads putts good. And I said, yeah, he's the guy that invented aim point. And he's like, <laughs> but he goes, it's, it's amazing. He just goes, he takes a couple steps, takes a couple steps, comes back, hits the putt and he's done. And I mean, I, I hope that wasn't too overdone, but I know that some people and it's, yeah. it's fun and yeah. it's something you can actually practice. Yeah. Well, I think that yeah. gives you a system, right? I mean, we talk about a system with our putters and, and having a system to continue to improve. So, you know, if you're doing something right or wrong and how do you know if you're hitting good putts or bad putts and how do you fix that? You know, when you're not with one of us as an instructor, as a, you know, even a, you know, a player in a golf, you know, at the club, that's an average handicap player, they go out and they really don't have a system to do whether it's green reading or potting. And so Seymour, I, I think gives them a great system for getting set up, but green reading you know, that that's a part that, you know, so many players, you can hit it on the right line and you can hit it with the right speed. But if you hadn't read the green properly, how can you how can you expect to make putts? And so how long does it take a, an average player to learn this process? The, the funniest part is where it the, the hardest part to learn about aim point are the very subtle and small breaks because it's difficult to feel those in your feet. But generally, the average player doesn't miss those spots too bad. But it's the it's the bigger breaks and, you know, the, they the don't really, play enough break. In oh, the yeah. And they don't play enough break on those. And it's you know, I mean, the old adage is, you know, missing on the high side, the pro side. And that's let me describe in plain English what that means. What that means in real life when you're playing is you hit a putt. You've probably played too much break. But as you watch it, you kind of go, I don't know. It's getting closer. It's getting closer. Where if you don't play enough break. About halfway down the road to your putt, you're going, oh, no, please stop. Please stop because <laughs> it's getting further away from the hole. Yeah. And that's I mean, it, it's been something where at the very worst people that input this system right away on those more severe putts, they're taking more break into account. And those putts are getting closer. Yeah. Oh, well, I think I've I was working with a player, actually a tour player a couple of years ago at San Antonio. And we were, we were sort of having a discussion. And like I said, I, we, we were not really having a discussion of aim point. It was just, you know, talking about how he goes about his process. And we were talking about how we get set up. And I think we've all done it. You, you walk up to the putt, you've read it, you know, whatever. We've walked around the hole 17 times and, and looked at it from every angle and we get set up. And then all of a sudden we get set up and it's like, I better play a little bit more. So we either give it a little bit more speed or we make the adjustment while we're sitting over it rather than backing off and restarting. And it's such, you know, we just never hit a really good, confident putt at that point. And I was talking to the player about this and he's like, you know, when he gets set up, he, it seems like he always hits these putts when he when he doesn't pick a high enough line. This is a tour player and a really good putter at that. On the PGA Tour, he he hits these putts when he doesn't pick a high enough line. He hits them firmer. And so then he's not picked a high enough line and it's going away. So he's leaving himself on these greens that are so quick with seven or eight feet coming back. And it's amazing because he knows when he sets his ball up, he's picking a lower line. And so he's having to adjust on the fly. So it's like, you know, you, just having that kind of system, you, you you seem to be helping yourself out in advance of getting set up to that pot. I have, and Ted, with all the players you've worked with, and, and literally, I know you've got some great stories, but I kind of have this code with a good friend of mine, Tom Creevy, who's worked with a few players out there. And it's, it's kind of like, he looked at me once, I said, what are you guys working on? And he said, firm on the low side. <laughs> and I started laughing and I go... <laughs> Those don't go in very much. Do they? <laughs> I haven't seen a puck go in the last 30 minutes. I would say it's lunchtime. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it at those different levels, and it is. We our our minds are great computers, but I mean, with um, the number of 
students you have from all levels from top tour to high handicap is there a certain player that picks this up quicker than others or like you know Stacy Lewis did I mean did she get it and go oh my gosh and just run with it and sort of like your your guys you talked about in South Dakota did did it take them a little bit and then you know I have a 11 year old boy who well when you're talking I'm like oh my goodness this could help him quite oh, a bit it's the the thing that it really does is it provides this window into something where you go and they make a putt and they go well that was really cool I wonder if it works again <laughs> And then when it works again and they keep moving around, they go, I should practice this <laughs> because it's kind of something so cool and so unique. Kid wise, kids pick it up really, really fast. And you'd be surprised how many times. Um, and this is even part of kind of like the training. I had a young lady that I was teaching who now plays college golf and little Erlina was maybe, I don't know, five three or so as a 13 or 14 year old. And her dad was about six, six and she learned this. And I said, okay, give me what you're looking at. Just give me something off in the distance, but don't say it out loud. And her dad, who is sort of a golfer was watching this. And so put this, I go, okay, what are you looking at over there? And he goes, well, I'm looking at the cell tower. And she looked over and said, dad, that's exactly where I'm going to aim that ball. And he's like, how can this pop? He's six, six. And she's 5'3", oh. and it's kind of like God's joke on proportions. Her mm -hmm. fingers are smaller, but her arm is smaller. So when it bends, it's actually closer to her face. His fingers are bigger, but his arm is longer. And when he bends his arm 90 degrees, it's further from his face. I mean, so it, it's it's like people that aren't even golfers kind of pick this up and all of a sudden like you know they get to play in the scramble and they're like i can't do anything but i can read the putt and of course they the group doesn't listen to that person the first three holes it turns out they're right they're like you just sit there we'll have the beer cart come by whatever you need just don't we just want you on the green for the putt that's it so it, it players it's just so different and so unique and head scratching and the funnest part is really you could kind of practice anywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can practice on concrete. You can practice. This is like a sickness. When you go to Publix, you'll watch. I had one of my students. I was walking into Publix with them once, and they turn sideways, and they go, yes, yeah, about 7% grade. And they walk right <laughs> in the store. It's like they may ask you to leave shortly if you make that move again. But I think the professionals look at it because it gives them an edge. Mm -hmm. I think the college kids look at it because – it's another skill and it's something different that they can practice. And I mean, the kids look at it cause they just go, this is cool. This is absolutely cool. You know, one of the coolest press conferences was after uh, Adam Scott first started doing this, he did a colonial. And I want to say he shot 66 the first day and you can, you can go back to the press conference and some guy in the back raises his hand and goes, uh, well, you notice you're doing this thing with your fingers. We believe it's called aim point. Would you like to comment on that? He leaned forward. He said, no, I would not. <laughs> <laughs> I finally have an advantage out here. I'm not telling anybody what it is. So it's, but it is that that's part of it. I mean, Cody, as you said, getting lined up, um, you know, and having hitting your line is good, but if your line isn't right and it's, and it's really designed to cut the number of putts down and make the process so fast. Well, I can see that's how the, um, it ties in pretty good with the Seymour putter, you know, Jim, the, the ability to consistently do everything the same way you have a set routine and now you go add this aim point to your routine and you can get it in what, seven, 10 seconds. The next thing you know, boom, I'm hiding the red dot and I'm off to the races. No, that's, that's seriously what it is. And I mean, I, I know we're chatting on this, but I, I kind of wanted to even throw in a little bit to your, aspect and some of the fundamentals that you guys so so much from all your experience out there the basics and i know with your seymour putter institute the technicals that are so I, i'm just going to tell you that when i went to aronimank um that's one of the first things is i wish i would have carried one of those little weighted balls down there with me because one of the ladies that was really struggling with putting i was like imagine i put a five pound ball in your hands now set up and address it. There's no way you would hold the ball out here, outside your shoulders. And she was like, oh, my God, I can feel my arm swing. She goes, I haven't feel my arm. She goes, 
I haven't felt my arm swing and I haven't felt a putter in the last two weeks. So that tells you how much fun I've been having out on the green. <laughs> but what are, I mean, just to kind of, um, and to throw it your way a little bit, what are some of those, those basic fundamentals and just that, that you see, regardless of the putter type, uh, you know, mallet or blade, what are the things that the top two or three that you see in every player? Well, I think, you know, speaking with Cody and, in learning from Pat O'Brien, the fundamentals of putting have been lost and where you give it all the time on your full swing. But when it comes to putting, we say this all the time. It's sort of like, oh, find one that looks good and feels good. And let's try four or five. And that's your magic wand for the day. Right. Yep. But if, you know, shooting free throws in basketball, you have a set routine to do it over and over and over again. If you can show them the funnels, the fundamentals and why it's so, so important to have a correct posture the setup being the same way, ball position being the same position every single time and make a good repeatable stroke. Now the individual knows what actually the putt feels like. So when they do start making a bad putt every now and then, they have something to fall back on because that's the good stroke that they can redo over and over and over again. For for both of you and having coached putting and done so many fittings as you all have, I think, and I, I, I could be off on this, but all of a sudden in the last year and a half, it's transpired. There's actually a sound that a solid putt makes. Mm -hmm. and, and Oh, yeah, definitely. And I tell people, and Cody, the first 12 to 15 inches, you know whether you made a good putt because the sound, the feel, and the roll comes off the same mm -hmm. way every single time. You look at it out of the corner of your eye, and before the ball even gets to the pole, our students go, oh, that's a good putt or that's a bad putt, just because of the sound, the feel, and the roll coming off yeah. the same way. The feedback you get is just different, right? And then I think at the highest level, the, the players like you mentioned, the fundamentals, those players that are putters, we can pick them out, right? You know, oh, when yeah. you go out there, you see, it's like, I, I know that person, that person, that person are going to putt well this week, just by looking at a lot of their fundamentals and the way they execute them. And I think a lot of the best players in the world, they just keep reinforcing that and they do the little things the greatest, right? And, and grip, posture, stance, ball position. I mean, it's amazing to see that those things sound so simple, but how how well that they reinforce them each week. It's like, okay, we need to check, make sure alignments, make sure our posture's good, make sure our grip's good. And it's like, those are the things that are taught. We teach or, or are learned when we first go and, and pick up a golf club. But if you keep doing it, it's amazing how I think, and you can speak on this, Joe, but how that promotes better mechanics in oh, yeah. the long run and continues just to build that. And especially when you get off, it's easier to get back into some, a, a better habit, right? Yeah, oh, there, there's no question to it. And probably the majority of your strokes, for those of you listening to the podcast, <laughs> The Putting Couch, you're on here because the majority of your strokes are occurring on the putting green. And if there's one place that you can get a little lax, oh gosh, that's only a foot away. I'll lean back on my right foot and take my left toe off the ground. And well, all these little nuances start to creep into your 15 and your 20 foot putts. And they're like, I look like I'm leaning sideways on this. How did that happen that way? And the best players, when they go to practice putting, they'll literally spend at least the first five minutes on all those technicals. Are my eyes over the ball? Where's the ball in my stance? And it's it's kind of neat just to, you know, at the beginning of a week in a tournament, some players will reset themselves at the beginning of the week and they'll literally hold the putter right in the middle like the, the grip is in their belly button. They'll bend over. There it is in the middle of my stance. I'm going to hit a few of those. Now, I like the ball a little more forward. So then they move it a little more forward and they kind of get to where it's comfortable. There's nothing sexy about practicing putting, but you got to hit those fundamentals because they're real easy to kind of all of a sudden you get a little loose here. Or you played slower greens. Now you're leaning to the left. You were in the wind. All these things can crop up and you're using that putter a lot mm -hmm. every time you're out there. You might use your eight iron four times during the day, but you're going to use your putter a lot. So that it's just and the other thing is, I think, and I, Michael Breed and I did something a while back and. Somebody asked us a question. They go, how important is putting? And he looked at me and I, he said, Joe, you answer that. And I said, nobody in this room has any earthly idea of how unbelievably important to the nth degree that putting is at the highest level. You guys have no idea. And Michael said, uh, infinitum. <laughs> that was the answer. <laughs> He's like, it's the most important part of the game. And you yeah. You guys have not only made a science of the piece of equipment, you've you've got a science in the way to help people train 
to get back to center week after week. And that's the one thing you have to look for. Yeah. And I think, I think Joe, you know, with, with both aim point, a system of reading greens, a system of uh, being in the same place, at, you know, at the same time, all the time with the Seymour putter. The other thing that both of those do is they're going to take that doubt away from the golfer, you know, because one way that you're definitely not going to hit the ball square and get that great sound is if you stand over the ball. And at any point in time, you have any sort of doubt as to whether or not you're square, you have any sort of doubt as to whether or not you're, you've read the putt correctly because it just seems like so many golfers um, it's, it's just that last second before they hit the putt, something goes through their brain that they're not confident in and it just throws everything off. That's, I mean, that's a tr- tr- literally truer words were never spoken. And when you get over that putt for your club championship or the state high school to make the state finals, those putts, you want to be able to go, um, I'm going through my routine and I know how it works. Um, I just did an event with Stacy, uh, socially proper. It was all online. Okay. <laughs> but literally somebody asked her, what do you do over pressure putts? And she said, I really rely on my routine. And she said, uh, she had about a four foot putt in Mexico the year that she won the player of the year. And if she made that putt, then everything was sealed. Otherwise it was going to come down to the last event. And she said, I remember thinking, okay, I'm behind the ball. I'm going to step up to the ball. I'm going to stake, make my practice stroke. And just like Joe tells me, eyes, blade, feet, I'm going to put my eyes over the ball. I'm going to put the blade behind the ball. And she said, when I said that, I heard the ball go in. She said, so I was still literally going through my routine, but it was on such auto that to be able to step up and do that same thing every time was just huge on her behalf. Hey, can I can I throw one thing in here? Kind of like, yeah, I feel like the guy who's not only going to offer the Ginsu knives, but the Ginsu <laughs> orange peeler. I'm going to throw this in for free. <laughs> there is something good knife. <laughs> there, there is something that uh, is pretty cool. And it's a little workaround for aim point, but I will share it with everybody just to intrigue them a little. Uh, one of the things you talked about the player having to hit it firmer or, or, you know, maybe. And one of the things that always kind of made Mark Sweeney scratch his head was those three footers because the two, he's like the tour guys just literally grind over this. And he went and he did the math and he did the physics and he did the physics and the math. And I don't, that's fath or mystics. I don't know. It's mystic or something, or, but literally from three feet, you only need to play the ball in one of three locations. You either play it in the center, in the lip, or one ball on the outside of the lip. And it's not too hard to figure it out. If you stand with the ball between your feet and you feel fairly level, the most that ball is going to move is about an inch either side. The hole's four and a quarter wide. Mm-hmm. If you feel a little bit of slope, the most it's probably going to move is about three and a half inches. If you feel a ton of slope, it might move five inches. Well, being an ex-accountant, okay, the hole's four and a quarter. The ball is an inch and something else. So uh, four plus one is five. I kind of figured <laughs> that out real quick. But, you know, test that out. Now, yes, are there insane hole locations? There, That's your nine. That's your 1% out of your 99%. But honestly, put it in the middle, put it in the lip, or put it outside. And once you get comfortable with that, when you go out Saturday morning and your buddy goes to rake it back, you go, uh, 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 today, my friend, we are putting them out. <laughs> <laughs> you practice, say you go out with Stacy and testing the greens. How do you guys test speed control out there on the, on those greens? She does something every week that I just think is phenomenal. And that's one of the first things we ever worked on with speed. And there's that, that's if, if you guys would be nice enough to invite me back, I'd love to do that on another yeah, yeah. But perfect. Just the easiest way to tell you is this. Stacy will walk out the minute she gets to a tournament. Uh, and, the, and here's another thing. We've all done this. We've all gone to play golf tournaments. And what do we do? We head to the range and we tee up the driver. Well, I got to tell you, no matter where we tee up the driver, it's the same everywhere in the world, right? And even if we go to Top Golf, which means if I'm on the upper floors, it's airborne. Thank God. <laughs> <All right. laughs> but literally, the best players in the world immediately go to the greens. They immediately go to the greens. And Stacy knows where the ball is played in her stance. And she will literally hit a putt that will go back to her right foot and through to her left foot. She won't even look up. She'll probably hit four or five. And as you can imagine, with a player of that level, the grouping gets real tight. But on standard conditions, maybe that putt goes 
12 to 13 or 14 feet. The minute she, the, all she does is she puts a tee down there. She walks off what the putts are and she goes, oh, well, this is my base stroke for this week, but it's going 16 feet. Mm -hmm. And then she might work inside her feet, outside her feet. But it's developing that 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 ground zero or the cornerstone to go. I know what this stroke does. Yeah. And she's got that calibration. Yeah, that's every, exactly every single week, no matter what the green speed is. She knows this is my stroke length and this is how far it's going to go. It's totally it. And it's like, I'm a putter. Here's a putter. Here's a putter in my hands. I'm a putting golfer. I'm not going to go, well, this week I have to hit that putt harder or softer. It goes this week. It goes 12 mm -hmm. feet. Last week it went 10 feet. Next week it might go 15. So I, I no, hope that helps, yeah, but that's no, does, job it, one. I mean, no, that's that's incredible. I mean, that's, it seems to take the fear out of mm -hmm. fast greens easily because you go, oh, OK, I don't have to I don't have to be scared. I know how far it goes. Yeah, that's such a great method for, you know, a lot of our listeners mm -hmm. too to go, hey, you know, when you go out, because most of, you know, like me, I, I my first putt's on greens. hole one. Right. Yeah. So at least at least you can, when you drop the second ball down on hole one, then you can <laughs> calibrate that that putt there. But that is such a great method. You know, you got to have a calibration. Right. And I've heard I've heard Zach talk a lot about that. And I, I'm sure Jim can speak on that a lot more than I can. But I've seen him. You know, he always talks about I right, obviously sticking with the, you know, the same process over and over and, you know, calibrating speed. Right. And it's sort of like the same process. There, there's a way to calibrate speed each week. And, you know, we look at the best in the world because they're they're the benchmark right how are they doing it and why they're so good at it i mean yes they're crazy talented but there's reasons why they're doing it and so if we can peel off a few pieces and peel that lower back that, that's such a good process to have for yeah. any golfer and, and there's not a zach who's oh i'm a timid zach this week or i'm an aggressive zach this week he goes i'm zach the guy with the putter in his hand and yeah the putt yeah that's that's crazy good Hey, thank you so much. What a great putting couch. Episode 36 today with Joe Hallett. Joe, we are going to have you back many times if uh, <laughs> if you'll have us. So we would uh, we would love to just continue these conversations today. You know, hey, the takeaway putting is infinitesimally important. And if you really want to be a great player, you know how important putting is. And the, the best way to, to enhance your practice sessions, which you're going to have to have, is to have some simple systems. And we learned a lot about green reading. Uh, we learned a lot about aim point and, and anything else. I mean, whether it's a, a system for understanding speeds and giving yourself a benchmark there, or whether it's using rifle scope technology and a Seymour putter to give yourself uh, consistency, all these things are going to help you become a better putter. And that's going to be the fastest way to save strokes because you take the most strokes with your putter. And, uh, you know, we, we uh, really appreciate the conversation. Joe, thank you so much. And uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you, guys. We appreciate you joining us. If you haven't subscribed to the show, make sure you do wherever you're listening. Be sure to leave a rating and review because that's how we get the Putting Couch podcast content in front of more people. Also, take a screenshot and share it on social media and tag us at Seymour Putters or hashtag Team Seymour.